Okay. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, reporting, and that's not something I've talked about uh, with you before. Um, at least if, if I did, it very minimally, because that wasn't really, uh, I wanted to, for those in the history class and so forth there, the purpose of that is to just introduce you to news writing, uh, not to teach you everything about journalism all at once, because uh, we were supposed to be studying journalism, I mean history, journalism history, communications history, and, uh, and uh, like I say, so we did not get into reporting styles and reporting techniques. Uh, this is, uh, again, some of what I put in my crash course is uniquely mine, and this is uniquely mine. But uh, so you're not going to see this in other textbooks. Uh, this uh, came from interviewing uh, more than two dozen investigative reporters and other reporters, not just investigative, report, investigative reporters, but that was primarily be who I... Uh, who I uh, uh, interviewed because they were most interesting <laughs> and because they had the hardest job. Investigative reporting by its very nature is reporting what people want to hide from you. And so, they, they like I said, that is the hardest job. Uh, for most of us, most of our reporting is fairly straightforward. People are willing to talk to us, sometimes even anxious to talk to us. Uh, they sometimes lie to us. Uh, and we've, I've already referred to some cases where people have lied to me or where they've actually, actually to the other way, or in a sense, the other way around. They told me the truth and then they lied about telling me the truth. So there are people uh, like that who, who uh, in, in every city and every village, there are people who will uh, say basically that you lied because you told the truth. And that, but that's still not very hard reporting. Uh, it's good reporting, but it's not hard reporting. Uh, investigative, re investigative reporting, again, by its very nature, is difficult reporting because people are trying to keep information from you. Um, in this day and age, in America, I think there's a lot of stuff being passed for investigative reporting that is not very good investigative reporting. Uh, it's it's uh, taking leaked information from biased people and reporting it as if it were fact. Uh, and that's happening a lot in America with this uh, almost um, piranha-like uh, effort to, uh, to destroy Donald Trump. I'm not in love with Donald Trump. Uh, I do like most of his policies. Um, he is not the best person in the world. I would not, as, as was said during the election, I would not ask him to teach my Sunday school class, uh, my church class. Um, Clearly, he's, he's a, a spoiled rich boy, but he also knows business pretty well, and he seems to be doing pretty good as a negotiator in government, uh, succeeding for, uh, maybe not totally succeeding yet, but uh, his efforts with North Korea are admirable, let me put it that way, and a lot of his other efforts are admirable. Nonetheless, there has been an effort going on from the very beginning by people within the government to leak information to make him look bad, and a lot of it has been shown to be not true, and that has been passed off as investigative reporting, is that somebody secretly gives you information and so you immediately report it as if it were true. That's not investigative reporting uh, because it's not good reporting. It's not, in many cases, it is inaccurate reporting, and it's reporting information that is coming from a very biased source. And so, um, the, what I, the investigative reporters that I talked to were before this era of investigative reporters who are not very good investigative reporters. People who actually did work in Watergate in some cases, uh, where that brought down uh, President Nixon's uh, administration, and people, uh, including people that are more recent than that, but they were truly doing investigative reporting uh, in, a, in a way that is, was, a war, was worthy of the Pulitzer Prize, which is the top journalism prize in America. And so these ideas really came from them, um, not exactly in this form. I, I put them into a form of eight eyes of information gathering. But for example, when we get to investigating, um, investigating could cover all of this. But what I kept hearing with invest when I was talking to investigative reporting was that the real key was getting documents, which in most cases is not being uh, uh, successfully achieved in this uh, current generation. 
it is hard to get documents. Um, but uh, it, they put such an emphasis on it that I decided to, as long as I was looking for eight eyes, uh, that I would go ahead and make that more or less the definition of investigating was to go beyond interviewing and get documents, uh, which again is, is uh, extremely challenging to do. Um, so anyway, I want to go through these. Uh, in doing this, I admit right from the start that I am breaking all my rules. Uh, I've told you don't put too much, uh, uh, too many words on a page, but these are direct quotes and I am going to read them directly. Um, these are from some, this one is totally from, from me, but uh, the other ones are almost all direct quotes from, from the investigative reporters, or, or if not direct quotes, at least indirect quotes. Um, so I'm just going to go through these, and uh, you'll have this to fall back on rather than uh, you, I'm not saying you should not read the chapter, but uh, this is a pretty good synopsis of it, along with whatever commentary I give with it. Uh, I could make this bigger, and maybe I should. Well, I think it's bigger if I go. What I like to do in this in this form is this allows me to blow up if I want to and, and actually make it bigger. But even then, it gets kind of uh, crazy trying to fit my video, and maybe I just need to take my, turn my video off, and that might be easier. But let's go to the show view and see if that's better. Um, it actually is not any better. It's almost exactly the same. Well, no, that is better up there. It's not so better down here, but so the uh, recorded version is going to be about the same as it would have been. But uh, your version uh, that you're seeing is, is a lot better. So I will go to the show version. Okay, so in this version, you don't have my my video interrupting you. Okay, so um, uh, innovating. We did talk about that already, but I, so I'll go through this rather quickly. But you need to keep an idea file. You need to write down any ideas that may occur to you, but which uh, you have no time to pursue. Your ideas are extremely valuable. Your ideas can be worth a million dollars. Uh, you just don't know which ideas they are that are going to be worth a million dollars. But uh, ultimately, uh, it is you know there are journalists that are make you know they have made more than a million dollars on their on their stories, not for what they put into the into the newspaper, but from from what they then take from their newspaper reporting and make into a book or whatever. Uh, so uh, it is possible to take an idea and or ideas and make a million dollars from it. So it literally, an idea can be worth that. So you don't want to lose your ideas. And even if it's not worth that much, it may it may be at least worth your job. Uh, you're trying to compete with everybody else, and so you're uh, saving your job or getting promoted and so forth does depend on you coming up with good stories, and the stories all start with an idea. So don't uh, waste your ideas. Make sure you write them down. Uh, click. Uh, you can clip stories from other newspapers and magazines, as I've already mentioned. This is not plagiarism to take an idea from another newspaper or magazine. It's plagiarism to take their writing. Um, you can take their, well, you can, it is quite easy to take a lot of their ideas very quickly by simply calling their sources. So sometimes when I needed to do a story very quickly, I would see what the daily newspaper was doing, me as a, as a weekly newspaper editor, and I would simply call their sources and say, uh, I'd start off with, you know, is information in the daily newspaper accurate? They'd say yes. As soon as they said yes, all of that was, I could quote them, basically. They're saying that all the information in the daily paper is accurate. I can now quote the daily newspaper and said, say I was quoting them because they confirmed its accuracy. Um, and not in a direct quote uh, would I take it, but I, I might take it in a partial quote or I would... Uh, certainly take the information. Uh, then I would ask further questions to get unique quotes from them and to expand my story and pursue the unanswered questions uh, that always uh, lingered. Uh, so, uh, you know, clipping stories from other uh, newspapers and magazines is a good idea. If you think there's a seed there, uh, an idea that you can st uh, start your own story with, um, then clip it, put it into a file. Or in the case of if it's online, of course, 
you know, keep the URL or whatever, uh, or you could print it out if you wanted to. Publications from other communities often provide good ideas that are applicable locally. Competing uh, media open doors and frequently fail to pursue all the questions. So again, that's more or less what I was saying. So it's a, it's a continuation of, of the second item there. Uh, keep clips of good stories you and your own colleagues have written. Now, why would you do that? Well, because you're going to want to follow up them. Again, clips not physically necessarily, but uh, uh, electronic versions. So you might want to, uh, anyway, you start with that idea. And let's say um, you covered a murder story. Somebody was murdered in your community and you covered it. Well, sometime, and there's, they don't solve the murder right away. Uh, would be one example. Even if they do solve it, there's still unanswered, unanswered questions for the family. So it could be a year later before you say, you know, I did not follow up on that story. Uh, did they have, do they have clues on who, who committed the murder? Uh, how's the family doing? Uh, you know, maybe children were left orphaned or whatever. There's always angles that if it were a, was a good story a year ago, that there's a good opportunity or a good chance that there will be a, a, a good story now to follow up on. So old stories are not necessarily dead stories. Uh, they, they give other opportunities. So uh, keep, uh, keep track of the stories that you and, and uh, some cases colleagues, if uh, you were working with them or if they left and you can't, are expected to pick up their beat or something, uh, but at least keep track of your own stories and go through them once in a while. Say, so, okay, this is what I wrote a year ago. Is there a follow-up to do here? Um, review your, your idea file frequently to see if the time has come to, to uh, pursue one. So it doesn't do any good if you never look at it. But uh, so particularly if you have time and uh, you're lacking a good idea, then pull out your idea file. Uh, another file, as I mentioned before, is what I call the beggars list, which is basically your contact list of your of people you've talked to already. They already know you. Uh, hopefully, they respect you as a journalist. You've done a good job in the past for them, hopefully. Uh, but even if you haven't, I guess, uh, they know you. And so a quick phone call can frequently, or an email, it is possible to start a, a, a new story with an email nowadays. And I, I mentioned to some of you anyway, that I, with my one of my last publications, uh, the one that I was doing for the state of Washington, I was going, it was the only, even though it was, even though it was paid for by the education department in the, in the state of Washington, it was the only newspaper of its kind about migrant education. Uh, and I would attend national conferences People around the nation, including in the federal government, knew who I was. They were reading my stories. And so uh, there were opportunities for me to write stories that were of a national scope uh, because they were also locally important. So something that uh, the, the head of the, of the migrant program in the federal government might think is, very, is certainly important to my state because he provides funding and, and support for our state program. So um, a beggar's list can be extremely valuable. If you run out of ideas, or good ideas anyway, you can, uh, by email or phone call or whatever, you can initiate a discussion with somebody and find that they uh, have a new, a new idea for you. Um, you should not ignore that list. That is an important list. And uh, in some cases, you will find people who, once they have the taste of what it's like to be the source of a story, they, you actually don't need to call them anymore. They'll start calling you with story ideas because they like being in the newspaper. Uh, even if for some reason they were an anonymous source, they want to be in the newspaper. They want to th have a feeling like they're impacting uh, the government, impacting the local society, whatever it is. So fostering those relationships is a good thing. Um, I didn't put it here, but uh, I was originally scheduled to teach the mobile journalism co course that uh, Lucianne ended up teaching because uh, I had to go to the States. But uh, uh, if I had, 
there is now a trend towards uh, using Twitter as a good uh, source of ideas. Some, some uh, online reporters are saying they get their best ideas and their best sources from Twitter. So once you start building a following on Twitter, now suddenly, uh, again, people are, if you ask for ideas, they will send you ideas. If you ask for leads, they will give you leads. So somebody who's working online can use Twitter as part of their innovating process. Inquiring. You have to ask yourself what you need to know. Um, I am reading this partly because of exactly what I told some of you in class already, and that is I don't want to create uh, cognitive conflict. Cognitive conflict is when you put a lot of words on a slide and then don't read it. And so people are trying to decide, do I read or do I listen? And so I, I am purposefully reading exactly the content because it is word heavy. Uh, it is from the textbook. I'm giving you a summary of the textbook, in essence, um, of the best information in this chapter. But I'm going to read it exactly because uh, I don't want to cause the cognitive conflict. So you can read and listen at the same time because I'm going to read it exactly. Um, okay, so who's likely to criticize something? Who's likely to speak in defense of it? Who are the people who may have nothing to do with it but may uh, know something about it? So they don't have a my words off of the script. Uh, they may not have proof um, or they may not have a vested interest, let me put it that way. So in the current situation between Trump and, and the liberals within the government, um, there are other people who don't have, a, don't have an opinion, but they have information. And so they can shine light and actually those are the most valuable people. Uh, I mentioned uh, Jack Anderson is one of the the best investigative reporters that ever lived. Uh, two of my friends worked for him. One is his, of his, as his lead uh, reporter that co bylined many of his stories. One is his editor. And so I had a chance to meet him myself and talk to him. But uh, Jack Anderson, uh, his main thing was he had sources throughout the government uh, and beyond the government. And so he would brag that he would sometime get information before the president had it because he had such good sources within the government. And these were not, it doesn't say that none of them were biased sources, but by and large, they were not biased sources. They were uh, underlings. They were not political appointees. They had no political stake in it, but they had information and they were willing to share their information with him. And so he, as he said, was getting information sometimes before the president had it. So uh, that sort of person within a bureaucracy or within an organization can be extremely valuable to you to, to cultivate. Uh, that allowed Jack Anderson to write at least one investigative story every day um, and have it published. Uh, when I, I interviewed some, uh, uh, other invest some other Pulitzer Prize winners, he was a Pulitzer Prize winner, and uh, there was a panel of other Pulitzer Prize winners. The other Pulitzer Prize winners, basically, they, they won based on one story that they ever did. Um, and so when, when uh, they were asked, uh, how do you compare yourself to Jack Anderson, they basically said, we don't compare to Jack Anderson. Jack Anderson does an investigative story every day. We won a Pulitzer Prize based on one story that, yes, it took us a long time to develop that story. We don't do what Jack Anderson does. Uh, so he did a... He did a new investigative story every day uh, and, and uh, syndicated to 900 uh, newspapers throughout, uh, certainly throughout the United States and, and probably beyond the United States. Um, so going on. Uh, you move all the way around it. Uh, this is from Joseph Treister. Uh, I mentioned uh, to you that he's one that when he, go, when he was interviewing the union boss, and, and, and stuff like that, he did not take notes at all. At the time of the interview, he would take notes after he was done interviewing. So these are, this is from, uh, uh, the, the, from uh, Joseph Treister. Uh, you move all around it. On the way, on the more sensitive investigative stories, we find ourselves circling from a great distance. We don't know quite where we're going. You have to start looking under rocks. Investigative reporting involves using standard journalism techniques over a longer period of time to raise more issues and to interview more people. 
we spend more time exhaustively asking questions and hope to be able to, to write a story telling a reader really what's, what's happening, knowing whether you're right or wrong. I always reach that uh, point by interviewing a lot of people. So uh, this uh, relates to interviewing, which is the next topic, but it's basically saying you're going to have to poke around. If you really are going to take on a story uh, that is of true investigative nature that people are trying to hide, your first thing is try to figure out who it is that you need to talk to. Uh, who has that information? How can you get to them? Uh, so that's uh, as far as setting up your interviewing, you have to have to ask yourself that, that and then you actually go into the interview. Uh, this is also by Joseph Treister. Uh, there seems to be at least two schools of thought in interviewing. One is the tough guy, intimidator school, where these fellows manage to browbeat sources into telling them something. I never try that. That's not the way I do things. I only shouted at a source once, and I didn't get a story out of him. My approach is to go into an interview situation as a very sympathetic listener. I walk in, and I try to loosen him up and, and myself. I try to show him that I'm not going for his jugular. I try to be uh, jugulars, veins in your neck that would kill you if you did slice one. I try to be as friendly as I can without compromising my own position. I try to create a nice, unthreatening atmosphere so he can talk. We start with real easy questions. If I know the guy is lying to me, I just make a note of it and come back later. Then I say, you know, I heard that a little differently. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but I give him a chance to back out of it. A lot of times you can find a, a kind of peel the layers of falsehood back. Gradually, by the time you leave, you have a story. Uh, so this is, uh, again, where he went on to give his example of, of the union boss, where the union boss had used uh, union money to uh, take his uh, uh, mistress on roadwide trips and stuff like that, used the money for himself, and he just gradually, you know, starting with a very simple question he could deny, he said, well, but how about this information? And how about that information? And how do you explain that? How do you explain that your finance director has these receipts from Thailand uh, where you and this lady were together? What was your work there? So he just gradually introduced new facts, not in an accusatory way, but giving him a chance to explain them until at some point he couldn't explain them anymore. It became even obvious to the union boss that he was dead. You know, that, he, that uh, uh, there was enough evidence that he might as well just confess, which he did. He finally just confessed to Treister. I interviewed another Pulitzer Prize winner uh, more recently, a guy named Peter Fleeth, who worked for the Oregonian uh, in the part of the country that I work at. Frankly, they don't get very many Pulitzer Prizes in the, in the Northwest. Um, they do good reporting sometimes, but... Uh, they're kind of overlooked for the reporters from the big cities in New York and Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. Um, anyway, Peter told me uh, there is an arc to an interview. You want to come in and be friendly. Try to get people to open up. Then as the arc moves, goes higher and higher and you begin to mine the information you want between midway and two-thirds of the way through the interview, you want to hit them with the really hard questions. You want to be as, you want to be as mean as you're going to be. You want to ask them if they robbed the bank. But by the end of the interview, you want to leave them smiling. So he's saying you, you build, you provide your information, like uh, Treister was saying, until it's harder and harder information to answer. And then you kind of get friendly again towards the end, because you might want to go talk to him again. And uh, Treister said that this union boss that he helped send to prison sends him a Christmas card every, every year. So you can nail somebody and still leave them thinking that you're a friend. Uh, and that's basically what both of them were saying. Involving. So this came from Charles Young, uh, a, a former Rolling Stone uh, writer, um, now freelancing. He was also a, a, an associate editor there. He said, I've, I've done live-ins. So involving re re refers to obviously getting more involved in a story. And so he's talking about doing live-ins. He would go live with rock stars and stuff for a, a month at a time sometimes to do his story. 
So I've done live-ins both in Harlem and Beverly Hills, with the rich and famous and with the poor and anonymous. The basic idea is the same anywhere. You need to spend time with an individual. Spend 24 hours a day with your subject and be alert at all times. You never know when an incident will occur that will solve the subject's personality. I did a live-in in Harlem and spent all the time I could in a uh, junior high school there. I latched on to a couple of kids. I lived in their apartments and went to school with them. It was a completely different culture for me. I grew up white and middle class. These kids were selling heroin for their mo movie money. Psychologically, this technique is similar to, to method acting, where the actor is supposed to become the person he is playing. A journalist asks a person to take off his psychological clothes so, so the journalist can recreate him on paper. So this again is maybe not a, a frequently used method, but uh, he told some very interesting stories about his live-ins with movie stars and stuff and what he got out of them. Uh, so it could be. You may have that opportunity. Uh, consider that possibility. As I mentioned, uh, investigating, I went ahead and defined it very narrowly in my eight eyes uh, because I kept hearing the same thing. You have to get documents. You need documents. You need documents. And so it seemed to be uniquely uh, suited for investigative reporters that if you could get documents, you had a solid investigative story that uh, nobody could deny because um, you had the documentation to, uh, documentation to prove it. Uh, this came from uh, Jack Neuf Newfield, a, an award-winning author and investigative reporter for The Village Voice, the New York Daily News, the New York Post, New York Sun, and The Nation magazine. So he, he did a lot of work with different publications. Uh, the single most important tool of an investigative reporter are documents. Documents allow you to work in detail. Documents allow you to find facts the governments and bureaucracies don't want you to know. Just about every original or important story I've done has come from documents that were public records that other reporters were either too lazy to look up or didn't know where to find. The key lesson, uh, now I obviously mistyped this, the key lesson uh, is to read. Uh, you, have, uh, you have to read every piece of paper. You have to spend two to three hours a day just reading documents, reading transcripts. Uh, I can't remember if I covered it in the, in the chapter, but uh, some of the things that he would do, he would write a story kind of catchy, say like the 10 worst landlords in New York. And he would go into government documents where they would be issued uh, fines or, or orders to clean up their apartments, stuff like that. And so he based his 10 worst landlords on public documents of uh, citations that were made against uh, people with with rundown buildings and bad you know bad facilities. Uh, he did similar things to uh, judges, the ten worst judges in New York, uh, and that would be based on documents showing how many of them had their cases overturned in higher courts and things like that. So uh, he would, as he said, he, he a lot of his stories came from documents that were available to everybody, but nobody you know, other reporters did not take the time to go look for them. That may be more challenging in some place like Malaysia. I don't, not, I don't know what sort of laws you have that, that enable you to access documents. That may be fairly uniquely Western, that in the West uh, there are laws called sunshine laws that allow you to get to documents. And, uh, and if they're trying to hide them, sometimes you can make a fairly vague request. Get, I want all documents about such and such a subject. A lot of what's going on um, in this fight in America is being done with documents, particularly by those on the conservative side. Uh, just today, they, they released uh, transcripts from a, uh, a court hearing between a federal judge and, and, and the special prosecutor, where the judge is basically threatening to throw out the case against one of the people they are trying to, uh, one of the people close to Trump. And, and so they have the entire transcripts of where the judge is saying, you, your, your, your job was to investigate, investigate the Russian connection. In this case, you, you've trying, you're trying to get this guy to leverage him against the president, and he has nothing to do with Russia. And so you've gone beyond your, your uh, authority to do this. Well, that's all based on a transcript. That story is now based on a transcript that they were able to, to get a hold of. 
So uh, there's another group that is getting a lot of, uh, especially when, when the focus was more on Hillary Clinton, he was getting lots of stuff uh, that was showing uh, corruption in government related to that. Uh, so getting documents is really, truly investigative reporting. And actually, the conservative reporters are doing a much better job than, of that than the liberal ones in America right now. Um, okay. Uh, again, I went back to Peter Sleeth, and he said the same thing. Uh, documents are an ironclad way to make your case and print it in the paper without being sued. They are critical to really good reporting. Any way you can get documents is fair game. Documents are the gold standard. I know reporters who all they did, did was go after documents to become great reporters. And that uh, pretty much uh, includes, uh, uh, what was his name? I always forget the name. Yeah, Jack Newfield. Uh, that was pretty much his career. Documents, documents, documents. Uh, but Peter Fleeth, who also won the, the Pulitzer Prize, uh, uh, also found it was, you know, to really do good investigative reporting, you, you wanted to go after the documents the best you could. They're hard to deny when you get government documents uh, or other documents that have high credibility, usually government documents, um, that's hard for people to weasel out of. So it's a good thing. I'm going to say something else about Peter Sleeth. Um, well, I can't think of it right now. Go on. Uh, insisting. It's kind of going, basically it means just going, be, uh, making the extra effort. Don't give up. If there's a chance you can get it, don't give up too soon anyway. Um, not from this, uh, well, I'll go ahead and read this, and that I was thinking of somebody else who commented on that too. Uh, but uh, penetrate beneath the obvious, the superficial. Few stories could not be dramatically improved with more probing, uh, more, more probing questions of, pe of more people. The two key questions, um, you might recognize this, it doesn't have a source at the end, that's mine, so I'm reading myself here. But uh, uh, key questions most frequently overlooked are how and why, detail by detail, moment by moment. How did this happen? What did you say? Recreate the scene for me. How will this affect consumers, taxpayers, business, employer, employees, the economy, the society, the government, the future? What are the ramifications and consequences? How can we illustrate this, the problem? Give an example or two. How would you uh, argue the case for this? How would you argue the case against it? Weigh the pros and cons. Why did this happen? What led up to it? Who's really to blame? Why do you think they are, are doing that? Why doesn't anybody do anything? Why didn't you do something? Why aren't you doing more now? Why are you telling me these things? What is your motivation? Lots of questions to ask if you try to get the details uh, for a story. Uh, most of them how or why or related to how and why questions. And so this is just to kind of help, help get you or your brain started on what sort of questions you can ask to get more in-depth and get better stories. Whether they're truly investigative stories or just fairly regular run-of-the-mill stories, uh, you can take, as I've experienced, you can take a story that uh, a daily newspaper does that emphasizes the four W's, and you can take the, the why and how and kill them. Uh, you get to the how and why, and your story will be way better than their story. Uh, they had the first chance. You, you smash it with your, with your questions. Oh, I, I know what I was going to say. Um, yeah, I, I didn't include in this chapter a, uh, a Pulitzer Prize winning broadcast reporter. I wanted to save him for another chapter uh, that I haven't written yet, actually, on broadcast uh, journalism. But um, he was actually got his Pulitzer Prize as a print journalism. And uh, his name will come to mind in a second. But uh, he was then hired by NBC, and he then later went to CNN. Uh, to try to make truly investigative reporting on TV, because most TV uh, reports were not investigative in nature. Frankly, most TV reports were following the newspapers. Most TV uh, channels uh, don't have nearly the, the uh, um, amount of staffing that, that newspapers have had historically in America. 
And so they, as I said, pretty much follow the newspapers and they might try to do their own spin on it. They get video that, that obviously the newspapers um, frequently don't get. And so you can kind of see what happens. Uh, you know, you get some visual uh, information you can't get from newspapers. Uh, you get, uh, you actually see people saying things so that you know it you know, has high credibility and so forth. So, but anyway, what he was uh, saying is that um, he's more frequently seeing good stories killed by their own reporters than by anybody else, uh, where reporters finally just give up. They, they hit their, they feel like they're hitting their head against the wall. It's a good story. It, it, it would have been better if they had pursued it further. He thinks they could have succeeded, but they themselves gave up on it. Um, and so he says that's probably one of the biggest problems. And that, some, that also does relate to money. Uh, and one reason why I, even though I think there's a lot of biased reporting going on with what's called the mainstream media in America, I hate to think of the, of the world without newspapers with staffing to do investigative reporting. Although the bad reporting I've seen recently, I'm not so sure about. But you need people to investigate. And that requires money to pay people to investigate, typically. At least that has been the trend, that has been the formula in America for the last uh, many decades. It didn't always be that way. It wasn't always that way. So the first investigative reporting, uh, such as by Upton Sinclair, were done uh, by book authors. So they were not newspaper, well, they may have, he may have been a newspaper reporter, but that, I think that was a case where he took a story that he was uh, reporting on in the newspaper and made a book out of it. And so we may see investigative reporting changing dramatically. Um, there are people such as um, uh, Bob Woodward, who was one of the Pulitzer Prize winners in the Nixon case. He says he has total confidence that there will always be investigative reporters. There will always be somebody. Uh, it may not be like it is now. It may not be they, that they will be newspaper reporters. They may be book authors. They may be something else. They may be WikiLeaks. But somehow there, there will be investigative reporting going on. He believes uh, that, that there's a passion, that people will have, feel this passion, they, that they will insist, they will pursue stories to the end, even if they're not being paid immediately for it. And in fact, in some cases, maybe never paid for it. Uh, so uh, we will see. That, that is a, a problem right now that, that concerns me. Ingesting. Um, again, this is my writing, but I'll read it anyway. Once you've gathered the information for your story, you have to, to ingest it, analyze it, organize it. You have to look for gaps in your information. After you've organized your notes and are ready to write, take one more look to make sure, now that your notes are organized, whether you have failed to find an answer for an important question. Are there holes in your story? If you have a question you need to answer, or even if you don't, it's frequently advantageous to call one or more of your key sources one more time. They may have had some new thoughts since your last conversation. The more questions you ask, the more information you obtain, which lead naturally to more complete reporting. So um, ingesting, this is where in the book I start talking about uh, how to organize your notes. Uh, I'm not going to try to quote that, uh, but I'll try to explain it briefly. If I have a whole set of notes, and, and uh, particularly the most difficult kind of uh, organize, uh, note organize, organizing is if you have multiple sources and multiple topics. So first off, which topic is the most important topic? Uh, now multiple sources is okay once you decide what's the most important topic. So the first thing I do is I go through my notes and I organize it by topic. And so I say, okay, this is topic A, and everything that relates to topic A, I mark A beside it. Everything in my notes that is, relates to a different topic, I go on to topic B. I write B next to it. Um, and if I have a third topic, I write down next to those, C. Uh, so I organize it first off by topics. Then I go through and I look at all the notes I have, direct quotes and other notes I have for each of the topics. And then I prioritize those one, two, three, maybe even to four. 
So now I end up with A1, A2. Uh, there's not only a, one A1 necessarily. If I think it's really important, I might have two, even three A1s. So I go through all the A's and I prioritize them, one being the most important and anything below one being less important. So I, I don't think I hardly ever go below four, but uh, one to four, let's say, I organize all my notes about topic A uh, and, and prioritize a one, two, three, four, um, and I allow myself to have more than one one and I have more than one two if I, if I have lots of information. Uh, then I do the same thing with topic B and I do the same thing with topic three. Uh, this is for a very complicated story, but I need to organize my notes now in order to see just, uh, you know, what I have uh, and, and then prepare myself to start writing. Now, if I have all this on a computer, then I may color code it rather than, rather than doing it by A, B, and C, I may, may color code instead. Um, but regardless, whether you're doing it by hand, uh, even if I have it in the computer, I might print it out in order to, sometimes it's easier for me to see it on a printed sheet and do my marking on it anyway. So I, I do all my, my analysis of topics and how important the information is that I, that I have on each topic. My next question is, now which is really the most important topic? But that's going to be my lead. I want the most important topic uh, at the top of my story. Uh, it may be possible that within the complete lead that I, I suggest all, if I have three topics, suggest all three of them. But topics two and three are probably going to be suggested or, or mentioned in paragraph two or even a paragraph three of a complete lead. But, top, but, but uh, the, the lead itself is going to be topic one, the most important topic, almost certainly. And I'm not going to want to have a real long one, so that's, I'm just going to use one topic for the lead. Um, at that point, I may also do what I've mentioned to you before. I may look for the best direct quote for topic A, or for you know whichever one I topic I think is the best one. Um, we'll say topic A, and I look at excuse me, find the best direct quote, and I at least I consider the possibility of taking of rewriting the the direct quote into an indirect quote and making that a speech interview lead uh, with an indirect quote. Uh, again, in paragraph two, I might, uh, I might hint at other topics, or I might hold them if they're not that important comparatively. I may not even bring them up at that time. But uh, anyway, I figure out my, my paragraph two and maybe a paragraph three before I then go to the bridge. And what was the bridge? The bridge was the direct quote that I took my lead from. Uh, so once I have my notes organized, now I can write a story really fast. Uh, because I, I have, I've analyzed all the, all my notes, I've, I've separated them into topics and I've separated and I've prioritized the notes within that topic. And so now I can get to work and, and uh, even though a very long story goes fairly quickly. So that's part of ingesting, is analyzing it to the degree that you're ready to write. Uh, this comes, uh, both Joseph Treister and Charles Young made some comments about interpreting. This, um, I think, is the excuse that some people have for doing bad reporting. And so I would say, even though I'm the one that created this, um, take it with a little bit of a grain of salt in that don't use it as an excuse to do bad, to give your opinion uh, when you don't have all the facts. When you definitely have, when you have not gathered documents, you have not uh, nailed it. Uh, if you start interpreting your story and you haven't nailed it, now you're just reflecting your biases. And a lot of that's going on right now in American journalism. Uh, so from Joseph Treister again, New York Times, just stacking up a lot of facts is like baby talk. We better be trying to find the truth or we might as well pack up and go home. You have to give both sides and let everyone speak but we shouldn't stop until we know the truth. Again, this is for investigative reporting. Um, I guess it could be said of just about any story, but some is it's easier to think that you have the truth with easier stories. Anyway, going on. You are perfectly capable, justified, permitted, and indicted to demolish the arguments of people who are, you are quoting uh, if you've got the goods on them. In other words, if you know they're lying, you should pre uh, present the proof that they're lying. Don't, don't let them get away with lies if, if, uh, if you have evidence that they're lying. Uh, 
you know, go ahead and give your proof. And it's fairly obvious by your presentation, your story, you may not have to say, you don't necessarily have to say he's lying. But you're saying this is what he said, here's the evidence contrary to that. And so the reader can tell that he's probably lying uh, based on your evidence. Um, and the last uh, sentence of that paragraph, politicians are very good at taking advantage of reporters who won't do that. So, yeah, any and not just politicians, but partisans, people who are either officially or unofficially representing a, a particular uh, political perspective. You have to watch out for them real closely. But the truth, that's true also, though, for businesses, if, if you're trying to get through their PR department. Is a PR department going to tell you all the truth if they, you know, if they even broke a law, are they going to tell you that? Uh, obviously not. Uh, at least they're going to try not to. Uh, so whether business or government or union, uh, you know, re irrespective of, of the organization, there are the, the organizations frequently have reasons to lie. And so you have reasons to do better reporting to show that they're lying. Uh, from Charles Young with the Rolling Stone, you can't go through an interview and think you have, have to remain friends with the, the person after the interview. If you tell the truth as you see it, and that is your sacred duty, many times you have to incur the wrath of the reader, the subject, and the editor alike. Even the editor will be mad at you sometimes. Um, but truth is the only thing that matters in this profession. You have to write without fear of the consequences. So that's, we kind of covered that before. It's sometimes hard to do. Um, it would be nice to be friends of the mayors that I showed as being unethical. Um, you lost their jobs because I showed that they were unethical. Uh, it w I would have, if I could have just stayed their friends, they could have fed me lots of stories in the future and so forth. But that's not your job as a journalist. You can't be friends of people who are doing things that are unethical, illegal, whatever. You have to nail them. Um, you can act friendly, just like Joseph Treister was talking about. You act friendly, but you're going to nail them if they're doing something wrong. Uh, that's your job. Okay, I'm going to go. That's, those are the eight eyes. Um, and so that's, the, that's what you will find in the textbook. Pretty much... Uh, a uh, pretty good uh, review of it, uh, and you would, can expect some questions on that in your quiz. Uh, you have a quiz uh, on Friday. Um, I just want to point out, I have been asked by my students, uh, I've pointed out where some people have died because of their reporting, their journalism. Indeed, uh, I haven't updated this recently, but between 1992 and 2008, 722 journalists were killed in the line of duty around the world. So this is it's not uncommon for a journalist to be killed if they put themselves in a dangerous situation. It may be who they're writing about is very powerful. Uh, there was a case uh, that occurred just before I arrived at Kazakhstan where uh, there was a reporter, uh, I think she, among other things, she was reporting for Voice of America, but she was reporting for other, she was kind of freelancing. and. Uh, they don't even know exactly why she was, uh, why she was kidnapped, but she was kidnapped, and never heard from since. So pr presumably she's dead someplace. Um, her brother thinks that uh, she was. It was because she was reporting on dangerous conditions in coal mines, in Kazakhstan, but he's not really sure. Uh, she was reporting about lots of things. She was a good reporter, uh, so she was kidnapped and uh, presumably is dead. Um, this uh, was from a presentation I made about uh, a world-class reporter in Russia who uh, I may have mentioned her before, Anya Politskayeva, something like that. But anyway, Anya um, became extremely famous in Russia to the point where everybody talked about the uh, Gazeta as being Anya's paper, basically. Uh, she put, uh, I think it was... 18 different uh, influential people into prison, basically her reporting did, in 15 different cases. So she did such good reporting that I think she was went way beyond Joseph Treister to be able to come up with the evidence so that 18 different people had to go to prison, and not in just one case, 
It'd be one thing if it was one case, that if they're all related to each other, but it was 15 different cases. She put 18 people in prison uh, with her investigative reporting. I, I don't think I've ever heard of that level of results by anybody anywhere. Uh, but ultimately she was assassinated. Uh, she was going up the, her, her husband abandoned her because he was scared to be with her. Uh, somebody tried to poison her at one point. Uh, she survived that, but ultimately somebody just gunned her down as she was going to her apartment. So they got into the elevator with her and killed her in the elevator. Um, anyway, then this re refers to this other uh, Anastasia uh, Babarova, who uh, was also, you know, killed. And she had just barely joined the Gazeta after uh, the the publishers of, of the uh, Novaya Gazette, Gazeta were thinking about just closing down because of all the threats and after, particularly after Anya was assassinated, uh, within about a six year period, something like that, four journalists from that one newspaper were killed in the line of duty. Um, and uh, basically the reporter said they refused to stop, that they, they wouldn't let the publisher, the publisher thought it was too dangerous to re work for his newspaper. And the reporter said, we're going to do our job. And uh, so this one happened to be, uh, um, you know, killed uh, early in her career from the same newspaper. I mentioned uh, just going through some other things that uh, I thought could be valuable to you. I mentioned you could take a, uh, a national story and, uh, and make it localized. So nuclear terrorism is, is a, certainly an international story. Experts have frequently said it's not a question of if somebody will get a hold of nuclear materials and, and, uh, and uh, commit nuclear terrorism. It's only a question of when. There's just too much material out there for it not to happen someplace and probably someplace in the West. Uh, their main target would be America if they can do it. But uh, they may give up trying to get to America. There are more obstacles getting to America than there are getting to uh, uh, you know, London or someplace. So it could be um, something else. I did some creative, uh, maybe not all that good, uh, photoshopping on this photo. But anyway, so, you know, in doing a story uh, about nuclear terrorism, uh, actually today, just this morning, I read a story that relates to the bottom, this bottom story. So I took this story and, and I pretty much left the nuclear ter terrorism made it more of a national story, uh, but then I, the uh, local, a local uh, uh, organization, Pacific Northwest, uh, uh, anyway, Battelle is its parent parent company, uh, created a system that the government still uses to analyze data that they're bringing in. So there was just a story today that said data from phone calls and emails from. Uh, about, well, how do I say this, that 600, about almost 600 million, uh, the data from 600 million phone calls and emails have gone into the government, U.S. government system for analysis. Well, this PNNL created the system. And this was, uh, I kind of got a chuckle out of, the, out of the story today because it acted like this was reporting, <laughs> like this was new. It is new information. But actually, I reported on it 15 years ago uh, that the company that, that uh, worked in, our, in, my, in my area created the system for the government to do the analysis. It doesn't mean that they're actually listening on your phone calls, but they're analyzing who you're talking to. The story said that they don't have the actual phone calls. I'm not sure that's true. I think they may be lying about that. Because I think what, uh, at least according to what PNNL created, was that they, uh, um, and this may be, I'm thinking about maybe a separate story, but anyway, I, this one may be, they, they did a couple of things. One of them was enhancing nuclear detection at ports and places like that where they could detect radiation uh, at very, very relatively low levels that if it was in a box, you know, a box car, one of those shipping cars or whatever. But also they created this system that the government uses for analyzing massive data and correlating massive data and trying to figure out, okay, which of these people look like they could be a terrorist because of all the, who they're talking to and what they're talking about. They let the computer do that analysis before they ever listen in on a live phone call. 
uh, or a recorded phone call. So they don't get to, they're not listening in on you unless you're talking to some very strange people uh, that, that are that's already on their radar. And then they have enough evidence to go to a judge and say, we want to listen in on the phone call to this person because all of this data we're getting says this person has consistently talked to people that uh, have terrorist connections, for example. Um, so anyway, that was, uh, so I had, this is, by the way, the lower story then is called a, a sidebar. And this you need to understand for when you start laying out pages, when we start getting to desktop publishing, very frequently you have two stories that are related to each other. The second st secondary story, the, in this case the local story, is the sidebar. Uh, the more important story or the bigger story you might say is, the, in this case, the nuclear terrorism. The sidebar is an interesting uh, local angle from this local organization that's created this these systems for the federal government to use to stop nuclear terrorism. And so uh, be aware of the possibility of doing sidebars. You typically uh, just, again, we'll get much more into layout design uh, principles and designs, but in, Amer in current design, almost all newspapers use what we call a modular design. Uh, modular design means that every story that you put on your page as you're designing it is rectangular. It may be long rectangular, maybe totally, it may be a total square, it may be, you know, a wide rectangular, a deep rectangular, whatever, but every piece on your page is rectangular. So you piece it together uh, as a series of rectangles. Uh, that's called modular construction. And that's, uh, if you, whoever does the analysis of the 30 newspapers in America will probably find that there's only one who breaks that, and that's the New York Times. They like to thumb their nose at people and say, ah, we're better than you, we can do anything we want to. And so they do not use modular uh, design in their front page. And most of their pages they do, by the way, use modular design. So I think they just do their front page to just poke at people and say, ha, we're better than you, we can do what we want to do. Um, but uh, modular design is the norm. If you have a sidebar, however, you, do, you handle it slightly different. Uh, in this case, and I'll wander away from the computer here, uh, you can tell this story keeps going. It's going someplace. This story is probably going to end up the same place, or definitely, I know, because I did it. This story is going to end up the same place at the bottom of this story ends up. So the package becomes modular. Each story is not, this story is modular, I guess you could say, but the top story is not modular by itself because it's, the headline goes over the whole thing and that comes down one column only. And so the, when you have a sidebar, you can break modularity in the sense that uh, each story is not rectangular, rectangular, but because they're associated stories, the package is rectangular. And so if you have a sidebar, you can you can you have the reason to break modularity in a sense that that the story at least these, in this case the the major story is not rectangular it, you know you have the headline going across the top of the second story uh, and the photo do, goes with both stories so it's uh, you you make that my you make that combination of stories rectangular in nature so anyway that's so it's still is modular in the in the package but the individual stories are not rectangular. Uh, just going back to a couple of other concepts, again, um, just remind you that once you've done your analysis of your uh, story, when you've done your ingesting, uh, you need to then come up with your lead and you want to keep it fairly simple. Uh, again, the uh, you're probably only going to emphasize one thing in the lead because you want it short. 15 words is a great length. Uh, you can go to 35 words, but you want people to read your lead. So you want it to be powerful. You want it to be as short as possible uh, in keeping it strong. It's got, don't dilute with too, much, too many words and too much information. You want to capture their attention with the lead. So you can actually dilute the power of your whammy, of your hook, by putting too many words in or too much information in. So you want to pair out some of that information, pair out some of the words in order to keep leave what, what's most important uh, more powerful. 
I did give some, uh, I created some different examples, uh, or at least in some cases different. Uh, another, I just threw this into the, into the uh, PowerPoint just to remind you some different types of uh, leads. I did use a different uh, uh, Y lead and how, uh, yeah, Y lead and uh, how lead is, I think is the same as the other one I did. The speech interview lead is a little different, but Anyway, just through that in to remind you of the different types of leads, but still the, we rarely, I mentioned before, we rarely use, see a direct quote lead. Uh, this would be, and in fact, I don't think I used a direct quote, but I might have used a direct quote lead here. I, it's been a few decades since I wrote this story. But uh, if you're gonna use a direct quote lead, I would wanna be that short. I want to be very short if I was going to use a direct quote lead. I would not want a long direct quote lead. Uh, and I want it to be very much to the fact, very much to, to uh, what, what, you know, get to the point very quickly and, uh, and then go on from there. Uh, again, I want to emphasize the importance of photos. Uh, both of these photos on this page are natural, they're not posed. Uh, the governor is uh, on the right, it was the governor of, Was of, of uh, Washington State. Uh, you know, she, so I got her while she was speaking, that's, uh, uh, and then of course the main photo is, uh, you know, showing the emotion of this young lady who just won a, uh, she's a migrant student who doesn't, who comes from a very poor family and just got a major scholarship to uh, a major university in Washington State. So she's expressing a lot of emotion as she comes up to the stage to receive her, her certificate or whatever um, as it was announced. So you want to, a uh, couple of things here. First off, in just uh, newspaper design, you want that major photo up towards, uh, up towards the top and very frequently to the left, slightly to the left, and you want to get people's, this is a very small tabloid. Um, it's not as, uh, deep, it's not as tall as most tabloids. A tabloid can be 11, 17, and I think this one was 11, uh, less than 14. And so it was almost square. And so it was a little different to lay out this, uh, this size newspaper, size tabloid. Use the drop caps to give a different, uh, you know, some additional graphic impact to it. But again, this was at a at a conference where I probably took at least 400 photos. Uh, this was clearly my best photo out of 400, but you may have to, again, follow my rule for, for being a professional photojournalist, and that is just take lots of photos. You'll find one that's good. Um, this one, again, just another example, uh, another different conference, another 400 photos, and finding one uh, that, that uh, was powerful. I wanted to, uh, I guess we can read it up there. I can't read it so well in here, but um, this is, a, is an example. I mentioned that not every complete lead has only two paragraphs. And this is an example where one that did not, you know, had more than two paragraphs because it goes into more description. A big football player tries to squeeze the tears out of his eyes as the final session of the state uh, student leadership conference comes to an end. Another athletic team cries openly as he hugs one of his group facilitators. From one end of the meeting room to another, the teens are hugging their new friends farewell and promising to stay in touch. They found it difficult to express their feelings. I feel kind of sad right now, said uh, Aberdeen's Eddie Fuentes during the uh, final open mic session, but I'm happy too. Uh, the students appreciated the adult leaders who volunteered their time to serve as facilitators, chaperones, and administrators. I think the, anyway, goes on. Um, but ultimately, that's where does it, where does that lead in? Um, it probably leads. Um, I'm not sure where you where you say the lead ends, and maybe it doesn't have a lead, or maybe it all is a lead. I don't know. Uh, but it definitely did not end with paragraph two. Um, I suppose you could say it ended after paragraph three. 
so that maybe the bridge is paragraph four that I feel kind of sad right now, paragraph. Um, anyway, some, so as you're writing it, sometimes uh, your leads can be longer because you're getting into more description. Uh, if I were to, at this point, at some place here, suddenly go into an explanation of what the student leadership program is or the student leadership conference is, then uh, this would be a case where I might go eight paragraphs before I start talking about the real substance of what is the student leadership conference. Um, I kind of cover that elsewhere, so uh, I, I wouldn't say that is definitely the case here, but it could be. It could be that I could get all the way you know, down to about here and then start the story about the importance of student leadership, of the student leadership conference. Um, and that would be then a case of a, a multi-paragraph lead that is going through description in order to get to the point uh, of, of the story, the, the power of the student leadership conference. This is also the sort of thing that you could do. I mentioned the Wall Street Journal approach. Uh, maybe that's in the tutorial that some of you haven't had yet. But basically, I was talking about the Wall Street Journal takes an approach with its uh, statistic-oriented stories, is that uh, they have a formula, and they like to start off with an anecdote of some sort. So my example, maybe maybe change uh, the, the subject. Let's say that uh, uh, this is a story about how well immigrants are doing in America. And so you may start off one of the groups that's doing the best in America uh, is not commonly known, and those are people from India, uh, are some of the most successful people uh, in America. Uh, we, we think of other groups, but entrepreneurially, they seem to be doing better than some other Asians. They tend to be more entrepreneurial oriented. Uh, and so in, in your analysis of economic uh, achievement, Indians tend to be doing better than some of the other Asians. Other Asians may do better in their, uh, in their academic achievements, but the Indians are doing better in their, in their business achievements. Uh, so anyway, so you could have statistics about this that you get from the government, and uh, then you, your, your, the top of your story may be a, a story about one family, about how they came and achieved success in America. And so you start off with your anecdote, with your story, your focus on one family, and then you give the statistics, and so you kind of bridge out and you say, this is what happened to one family, and it's like a lot of other people which are achieving, here are the statistics. So that's the Wall Street Journal approach to a statistical-oriented story, and how you can make that into a, an award-winning story by, by changing the nature of it, by humanizing it by putting a human face on a story that is driven by a report from the, a statistical report from the government. Um, I want to talk also some more about photos. And uh, so, again, this was uh, our governor in Washington. Uh, two things I would say, again, I, what I emphasized, uh, what I emphasized in the tutorials is don't get posed photos. So this is again a one out of 400 photos, not a great, this is not an award-winning photo, but it's not a pose photo. I got her, you know, in mid-breath there so that uh, she wasn't exactly talking, but she, you know, it was, a, it was a nice picture of her, but it was not a pose picture of her. Um, I would still, it also is a picture that could be used at the top of the page. I mentioned if all you get is head and shoulders, that's not a very good top of the page photo. Uh, this one could be a top of the page because it has it has it's bigger, uh, and and even though the people off to the right are not, in fact they look a little maybe even a little strange on the other side of that lecture, and they add to the the environment of where she was talking and so forth. That there were other people sitting up there, whatever. Uh, we could crop a little bit off the left. We have a little extra room in the left that probably isn't needed. So when we start looking at cropping, uh, cropping a little bit from the left would be would be good. Uh, but I would still keep the other people in the photo, and this would then be a possibility for the top of the page uh, if I lacked anything better. Uh, here's another one. It needs a lot of cropping, a lot of room in the left, for sure, that should go off. Off the top, some off the top. Uh, you might even take some from the bottom. One thing in your cropping is you don't, there's some places where you can crop. Uh, you can crop at the chest, you can crop at the waist, you can crop 
uh, kind of in the thighs, don't crop off people's feet and leave the rest of the legs. That looks like you've done something atrocious. Um, so this is about as far down as you can go without going all the way and showing their whole body. Uh, so be careful how you crop. You don't want to look, again, like you amputated their feet, uh, something like that, or your hands. If their hands are all like this, you amputate their hands. You don't want to do that. Uh, so uh, be careful in your cropping. On the right side, you could probably crop uh, some off the right side as well. Uh, if you're trying to keep some of the information or the idea that he's giving a presentation with a PowerPoint in the background, you may not cut off uh, very much from the right in order to leave the PowerPoint. Um, but that's, again, a decision you have to make. But as editors, that's your job. Uh, you will have to decide how to crop a photo. Um, again, this is obviously not a posed photo. He's talking to people here. We could probably crop like this. If I'm going to leave any of the PowerPoint, I'm going to leave the title. So I might go just a little bit higher than his head to get the, leave the title in and bring it down like this, maybe. <clears throat> uh, this one needs a lot of cropping. But again, it's, uh, it's just part of an interview, and he's just talking, thinking a little bit about it as he's talking to me. <clears throat> So I'd much rather have this than somebody smiling at the camera. Uh, not a great photo, but I'm just throwing some in just to kind of give you an idea of what I want. I don't want them smiling at the camera. That's what I don't want. Uh, this one has already been cropped. Uh, guy speaking to the, to the conference. Uh, it's nice to get some gestures in. Uh, gives a little bit more action to it. Uh, obviously not posing for the camera. We're catching and, and so to get this by the way is exactly why you have to take lots of photos because uh if you're in a, if you don't have an ideal situation when he starts moving his hand forward it's going to become a blur you know, if the lighting is not real strong you're going to get a blurry hand you're going to get something in a blur while he's talking and so you need to capture him and try to stop that action in order to capture the the, the gesture but not blur the gesture so uh, some you can blur a little bit, it might look okay, but I was going to go in um, and maybe talk about leads and stuff. Uh, this is, I, I regretted not using more of the photo, but I wanted to keep the story. But you see other things that you could do as an editor. So these are, uh, there's a difference between a, a uh, sub-headline and a subtitle. Um, within the... Uh, the, the subheadline is up the top. You know, calls fiscal responsibility. That is, it's very, very common nowadays to have a subtitle to give more information. Some newspapers are instead of a subtitle using enlarged uh, summary. So it's a complete sentence, but it's enlarged like at least 14 bold or something to give you more of a hint of what's in the story. They want to help people skim the newspaper. They want to help them find the newspaper, the, the stories that they're interested in. Anyway, uh, I would rather have had a bigger, uh, made the photo bigger, but I just didn't have room. Uh, but besides the sub-headline, you'd have subtitles within, they'll break up. Uh, frequently the rule is something like, what if it's a long story, once every eight paragraphs or so, you should have a subtitle. Uh, which, like these, a little bit bigger type, bold, and kind of helps recapture the, the reader's attention and draw them further into the story. Uh, this is a, uh, well, this could be a pull-out quote, but it's not. In this case, it's a C-related C, uh, C story uh, in the Republicans inserted, so it's, it's referring to another uh, part of the publication that, uh, in this case, we inserted into the into the, our newspaper. Again, not as big a photo as I'd like to have and not enough other photos, but uh, uh, going to lead. So this guy is the executive vice president of Microsoft. And finding the lead, it's basically, uh, you know, Washington State and the U.S. are losing jobs already for lack of enough employees educated in math, science, and technology, says the senior vice president of, uh, for Microsoft. Uh, his company had imported employees from 144 different countries to work in Washington State, but the lack of a trained workforce and the inability of Congress to pass immigration reform have forced Microsoft to open a plant in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, says Brad Stevens, the company's senior vice president, general counsel, and corporate secretary. Uh, so anyway, this is uh, from a 
this is from a speech, obviously, uh, he's at the lectern. Part of what I wanted to emphasize here again is if you take something from a speech, understand that the whammy may be at the bottom of the speech. Very frequently you take a speech and turn it upside down because the, the speakers very frequently uh, save their ta-da, their whammy, for the end of, the, of their speech. Well, you want the whammy at the start of the speech. And so uh, his, his discussion of, of the need for immigration was, uh, was not necessarily at the start of his speech. It could have been at the bottom of his speech. I don't remember at this point. But I'm using this as an example of, of that. Uh, you know, that uh, in a speech you, you want to uh, look for the whammy wherever it's at. Do not report a speech chronologically. That's the easy way, but that's the lazy way. It's not the best way. Um, anyway, another, another example, a congressman, again, uh, avoiding the stare at the camera photo. In this case, he was being asked a student, uh, questions by a, a group of migrant students. Uh, at the conference that he was attending. Just looking at some other photos, <clears throat> these guys were talking about gang violence among the Hispanic communities in America. Uh, obviously, you can do some cropping, cropping at the top, certainly, cropping on the side. This was not a final one, but it, uh, and not the best. In fact, if you look really close, you'll find it's just a little bit fuzzy. Um, doesn't look in back the as bad in the projection as I thought it might. <clears throat> Uh, sometimes you have to keep, if photos are just a little fuzzy for some reason, uh, taking a photo in the dark room, so any movement creates a little bit of a blur, or something like that, um, don't use it at the top of the page. You don't want to blow it up so big that people can see the flaws in the photo. So there are some photos that they're good for some place on their page, but maybe not the top of the page. And with this one, this one definitely needs some cropping. And because it's a little blurry, I would put it not at the top of the page if I had something better. Uh, this one, um, not a great photo. Obviously, can use some cropping, but you're kind of challenged here to do any cropping because he has his hand clear out here. He was. Uh, we were talking about uh, some online scams. I had been doing some investigating of uh, of uh, uh, one of these Nigerian scams that goes around. Um, so the problem with this photo is, again, what's it going to look like if you crop here? You don't want to crop there. You don't want to cut off his hand. It's going to look really weird. So you can't crop off his hand uh, there. You could do just a head and shoulders and be okay. Cup, you know, not keep his arm at all. Um, if you crop too far over this way, then it seems kind of unbalanced. So you, you may want to leave a little bit of space on the right side because of the way it's, it, it's, uh, it's proportioned here. Um, anyway, that was the best one I got of him. I, I did not take a lot of photos of him, so I end up using that one. <clears throat> Again, this is a gubernatorial a governor a, a candidate. Uh, just among a lot of people, how do you crop this? Uh, you have a part of the face over here. You cut him out, uh, probably. You want to cut, but then in the background, you see some, or you may not be able to see it there, but in the background, there's some people behind this guy. So maybe you cut off, you can't, you know, are you going to cut off his ear? Are you going to, uh, some of these photos that you're trying to get naturally uh, turn out to cause some problems in how to crop it. Uh, I may have left that entirely as it was, or at least at what you're seeing now because to cut off the head leaves his hand. So if I cut off his, cut off at the ear, first off, have a hand with a cup in it all by itself. Secondly, there's some people in the background you can't see very well in the projection, but there's some people up above that I wanted to keep into the photo. Um, it, it's not a lot, so some of your photo cropping, your photo editing is some of your biggest challenges. How do I crop? How do I make this photo look best, not waste space? You want to get rid of, uh, you know, the dead space, so to speak, uh, such as in this next one of the same person, you have a lot of dead space behind him. So there's no reason to keep that dead space. Um, so you're going to probably crop at least, where's my mouse, there it is, 
at least in here, maybe keep the, in order again, not to, to have it totally off balance. You wanna, I wanted to keep the people in, some people in the photo. Uh, I certainly wanted to keep his gesturing and so forth. So maybe back a little bit uh, by the lectern, but you wanna cut some of that out. Again, we have kind of a partial head over here. I think that was actually where the photo did end. So the question is, do I cut him out? If I crop any further, and keep these other people in, I'm gonna have some hands here and legs and no body with it, or no head with it anyway. So, you know, when you start dealing with stuff like that, it's it's not perfect. You're not gonna get a, so I, I rather, I don't want posed pictures, but there are challenges with unposed pictures that you have to deal with. <clears throat> uh, the next few pictures here are, are about a, an activity that the migrant kids had where they climbed this uh, this tower, they had they were had a uh, rope connected to them or whatever, so that uh, if they fell, they would not fall to the ground. Uh, but it was kind of a team building and uh, personal, you know, do something that you didn't think you could do, sort of activity, uh, show your potential. Uh, so this guy on the right was near the top by that point, climbing up this tower. <clears throat> And these guys, uh, again, this could be cropped. Uh, but the uh, guy running the operation was getting people hooked up and showing them how to how to stay safe. Uh, definitely some a little bit from the left side could be cropped, some from the right. You wanna show that, that there's a rope going up on the uh, on the uh, tower, but you don't wanna crop total, everything from the right, but uh, you wanna, wanna show the rope probably. But um, in the background, probably at you know, the top of the building, something like that could be cropped. Well, you have to understand when you're cropping two things, you're cropping out dead space, but you're also, if you have a certain amount of space in your, in your page for that photo, when you crop out the dead space, the, the important part of the photo gets bigger if you're putting it in the same space. So you're trying to make the, the uh, uh, for example, the look on his face as he, uh, as he talks to this, this uh, young person, hooks that per person up, uh, the more you crop out, the more you'll be able to see his face because that becomes bigger, a bigger part of the, if you're in the same amount of space, his face will be a bigger portion of the photo. So you'll be able to see that better in your photo. <clears throat> These are just people standing by and watching. Uh, I did a complete photo page, in fact, maybe in at least one full page on this story, just uh, made it mostly a photo page. Because um, it was interesting, um, interesting event for the migrant students. So some some photos may not be real great, just kind of uh, filling in the space. Uh, so this was one of those that I might have used. I don't remember if I used it. But again, has space to, he's pointing in this direction, so you don't want to cut it off too close, but you know, probably in here someplace is fine. You know, how much of the top, depends a little bit on the, area that you want to fill because in, in making your modular layout sometimes you have to leave a little extra space just to fill it to the space properly uh, so may, you know these with the trees in the background could go a little bit higher if you needed it to go higher but you want to crop uh, behind this guy and and uh, forward here maybe around in here <clears throat> another photo where the migrant students are talking to a member of the uh, uh, legislature in this case in Washington, again trying to uh, capture, an, uh, you know, the action or the even if it's not, you know, it's not like he's doing a lot of gestures or anything, but it's obviously not a pose photo. Uh, again, cropping challenges here. The guy on the right, do we crop? You know, do we, if we crop this head totally out, then do we lose that guy? Do we crop in here? Um, that shoulder is too distracting if we crop in here. Do we crop this young lady in, out all together, and then we get it kind of tight on the, on the legislator? Um, those are, again, there's not a perfect solution to some of these photos, but uh, um, it's still, I think it's still better than a posed photo. Let me put it that way. I still, I'd rather have challenges in a unposed photo than have a posed photo that is obviously posed. And so that's my, here is the head of the education program uh, in Washington, again, talking to a bunch of people. 
Um, again, unposed, here she is uh, talking at the conference, unposed, gestures. Uh, another educational leader, this one could obviously be cropped, uh, probably in here and over here, and then there's room here, or there's dead space here. So you probably crop in here above his head and then go ahead and keep the back of this gal's head, uh, but uh, something like that. Another op, uh, person talking to a PowerPoint. If the, if the content of the PowerPoint could be useful, uh, then you may want to keep the whole power, the whole slide. So this one might be cropped, uh, maybe cutting off at strategy and coming down here. So you have the substance of the slide um, and maybe cropping just a little bit higher um, in, in his thigh rather than at the knee, kind of in here. Again, the more you crop, uh, it's, it's just like I was talking about uh, having too many words in a, in a lead. Well, you can have too much nothing in a photo. So by cropping it uh, like that, now that image in the same amount of space, it becomes bigger. You get to see his face, his expressions on his face better. This one was more or less cropped, or was more or less posed. Uh, this was a guy talking to me about gang violence in our city, and so he was showing me all the knives and stuff, all the weapons they had uh, confiscated from gang members in our city. Um, I, I could hardly get a, I mean, I wanted to show the all the weapons, and I wanted him in the, the photo, and so there's hardly anything to do but, but have him pose it, but not look too terribly posed, uh, minimize the pose as much as possible. And emphasize, in this case, I was emphasizing the weapons and him demonstrating the weapons so, or, or, you know, pointing them out. It was clearly posed, but um, among posed pictures, it not one of the worst ones I've ever seen. Uh, another one that can be cropped, person speaking at a lectern. So a lot of these I use them because I'm, if you're going to do include uh, uh, professors in your stories, uh, then these are the sorts of pictures you might have. Um, and uh, you, you might, you know, again, you get them in action rather than just staring at the camera. And going back to some of these, you might get more in the classroom. Now, this isn't exactly a classroom, but you start getting more people, uh, like the governor, the, um, well, this one, maybe people are up talking to the professor after, at the end of the, uh, at the end of the class, like frequently happens here. You can get some pictures there. Um, we're talking uh, this guy here. That's that could be similar to a professor talking at the st at the front of a of the class, getting some students in from taking a side picture like that. So these are the sort of photos that uh, you might encounter. And uh, again, I uh, since I hate posed photos, this is very likely the sort of thing you're going to get. These ones, like this one or this one, if you can get more people in the photo, that could be the top of the page. We, we Again, it's hard to make a head and shoulders the top of the page. So you want to get some photos that have more than just the head and shoulders. And so something, again, with students talking to the professor afterwards or getting a shot where you're getting the, the professor and now you're getting some of the people in the class or whatever, uh, would, would allow you to maybe use that as a, at, at the top of the page when we start getting into design. Um, anyway, again, somebody speaking in a lectern. More of a, uh, you know, this is a sort of group discussion. Uh, there might be in some classes something like that or some situations. An interview where i have just, this would not be the top of the page probably unless you were desperate. Um, can definitely be cropped. If you were going to use it at the top of the page, you might leave some extra space just because you want it to be more than just head and shoulders. So maybe a little bit more of the environment, but you still got to do some cropping, especially in the back here. Definitely crop that. You might actually leave the table if, if you're going to, if you have a bigger space to fill. Maybe crop the back a little bit from the top and, and leave some, some of this somewhat empty space in front of her just to make it a bigger photo if you feel like you need it for design purposes. This one presents a different type of challenge. You may notice that the gal standing next to this guy has her eyes closed. So 
you know, the timing isn't great. And so do you want to take use a picture with the gal with her eyes closed? Uh, the other gal next to her, you know, is looking and that you know, she's okay. But this guy has her eyes closed too. Two of, two of the four have their eyes closed. So uh, and then you have somebody here back here behind this guy. This one I unless I was really desperate, I would be cropping, get rid of the ear, get rid of a lot of the stuff in the background and just keep him. He has a he has a nice on look on looker sort of you know, you don't have to get somebody talking in order to make it look natural. And so um, there are times when you're taking pictures of the audience, not of the professor, not of the politician, but you're taking a picture of the audience. And so this might be very cropped in to get rid of the closed eyes and stuff. It might still be part of a, of a package, not your lead photo by Arlene Maines, unless, unless he's important for some reason. But as part of a story where of a professor, a picture of a student in the class having an intent look, intense look on his face is, is appropriate. Again, capturing the gestures. Uh, I mentioned you might have uh, some photos uh, in front of some of these pretty buildings on our campus. So you, you're still not posed. Uh, you could have the professor walking back or either talking there or walking back. Uh, this happened to be the state capital in our state that they're walking from. The migrant students are walking from there where they were meeting with legislators and, and uh, the governor, whoever. can't remember who they are meeting with that day. But uh, so there are some pictures you could do here on campus that would have nice background. And I would look at for some of those as possible top of page photos. Uh, more than, you know, if you can't get good photos in the classroom. Uh, just another in in uh, during a speech capturing that uh, a moment this guy had more gestures he was i think it's doing some sort of indian song or prayer or something so it made it a little more interesting this guy's talking but he went ahead and i think he had some students come up and uh so it was uh uh made it a little more interesting and obviously could then be a higher could be uh used at a in a higher or more strategic location on your page and design. Um, the looks in their faces aren't, aren't bad. They're listening kind of as they're standing up by him. Uh, something like that is, uh, could be pretty, pretty good. Here the students are doing some, pro some sort of a problem solving task. Again, you're getting expressions and, and stuff that, uh, again, maybe not top of the page, but uh, someplace on the page but would, would be interesting. You can also make some of your own graphics if you get some statistics, um, I just grabbed this one. Uh, I, you know, just something I created uh, at the, uh, on, I created on Excel and exported it from Excel. Um, you can also, besides exporting, uh, you might, I, I introduced you to Earthenview or some of you anyway to Earthenview, uh, which I use for screen capturing. It will capture anything on your screen, including video. You know, it take pictures out of video. Um, and in some cases, you get a better quality by using the screen capture function in, in uh, Earthenview to capture something in Excel uh, rather than even uh, exporting it. Uh, but you have a couple of variety uh, options there. I think that was it. But I wanted to, like I said, I wanted to just, uh, besides talking about the eight eyes of, of, uh, of reporting, um, I wanted to follow up on some of the stuff I was talking about um, particularly in the last class for those who had class, had tutorial last week. So some of this will be a little bit redundant perhaps uh, for those who are making up last week's tutorial uh, tomorrow. But uh, we need graphics. That's one of your uh, assignments. Uh, you will be downgraded if you don't have some graphics with your story. Because, uh, and that's really essential as you start designing, we need essentially every story to have a graphic. Uh, in some cases, we can do, um, I'm trying to think if I have an example. Uh, I, I showed you the one page where there was uh, an insert, a blurb, as they might call it in the book, going back to uh, one of the previous pages. 
Okay, so this one has a blurb. Now this one just happens to be refer referencing back to a uh, to another story within this publication. But this this could also be the way you present a pull-out quote. Uh, so I have just a couple of seconds here. I'm just going to address that a second uh, because we're talking about graphics and the importance of graphics in your uh, in your uh, layout. If you don't have any graphic or any usable graphic you think as a uh, design editor, um, then you can pull out a quote from the story. Um, well, we might use this one. Um, this is a quote from the speaker from Rossi, his name is last name is. Last time uh, when we got started, polls had Christine Gregoire at 48% and me at 17%. Uh, I only had 15% name recognition, said, said uh, Rossi. About 80% of you folks thought Dino Rossi was some kind of wine. Uh, no one uh, had an idea who I was. When you pull out a quote for graphic purposes, you leave it, you also leave it in the story. You don't delete it from the quote, you just copy it. But then you bring it up and you make it uh, larger type, bold, probably italics, uh, you can make a shadow box out of it, you can make a pull-out quote quite large. You can, uh, uh, you can make a pull-out quote maybe a column and a half in this layout, this kind of a wider layout. So you can make a, you can wrap the story around it over this side in, in column three. So you can actually, ideally, with, if you're going to make it that big, you might have a, a mugshot of the, of the person too, but then you have their quote in like 14 point uh, italic you have his uh, a name at the bottom, and you might ideally have a photo and put all that inside of a shadow box, a box that looks like it's casting a shadow. Um, so you can actually take uh, something, do that, and make it quite a uh, important part of your graphic layout. Uh, so uh, you may have to, if you find that in your layout you either cannot, that there aren't good photos with it, uh, and uh, Say you your design has a has a one column story coming down one side of the the page. Uh, you're very limited in what photo you could use with that. Uh, if you have bad photos, then the one column story you're going to use is probably one of the bad photos. So you can choose in your selection. If you have three stories in that page, you're going to choose the one with the worst photos to make a one column story out of it. Uh, but then you might use uh, a pull out. This one is only a half column. If you were uh, if you had a one column story, you could make it the full column wide and jump the story over the quote and continue. Uh, but you could also do a half column quote and uh, make it a little bit smaller and wrap the story around it. But it gives you some additional graphic uh, uh, impact for your page uh, if you don't have a good piece of art to put in there. Uh, so that is uh, we'll learn you know that there's a lot of subtle things that you use. For, for that have some graphic impact. I mean, back here, uh, the subtitles have graphic impact. The subheadline has graphic impact. The big cap, uh, the drop cap, has graphic impact. Uh, your headline itself, obviously, has graphic impact. So your headline, your subheadline, your subtitles, your drop caps, your pullout quotes are all ways to add different pieces of graphic uh, impact to your page even when you don't have photos. Uh, and, and ideally you have all of the above. Um, again, I, if I had, you know, I thought the story was more important than the photo in this case. This was not a uh, front page uh, where I needed really great layout. So, uh, but ideally that photo would be at least two, two, two columns on this coming down quite a bit to deeper than it does and a, and a second photo down lower. But that would be an ideal design. Uh, this one I chose to keep the story rather than putting in more photos. Which is, by the way, one of the challenges that I've had to face all of my life is that when I work uh, for weekly newspapers, when I'm an editor or publisher of weekly newspapers, I'm also a photographer. I'm also the reporter. And so I get to a point where I have to decide what's more important. And which hat, which, which of me, is going to win the argument? 
me the writer, me the designer, me the photographer, which me is going to win the argument of how to design this page? Am I going to leave more story because I think the story is important? Then my reporter self wins the argument. Am I going to cut story and make the photo bigger? Well, then the photographer me wins the, the argument. Am I going to cut story and use multiple photos because then that makes ideal layout? Now the designer, design editor in me wins the argument. Um, so basically, uh, you know, when you work for a smaller newspaper um, and you're doing wearing more hats, it also makes your job more challenging. Uh, who's going to win the argument? Uh, and when you're arguing with yourself, that becomes particularly complicated. Uh, in this case, my reporter self won the argument. I wanted that story in, so it's not an ideal design. It's not ideal use of the photo. Uh, but my reporter self was insisting that I was going to get this whole story in the page, and so I did uh, with a less than ideal uh, layout. So. Okay, any questions? Uh, we are three minutes from the end of class. So, uh, as I mentioned, at the end of this week, you will have a quiz on Friday, and that will be mostly on chapters two and three of the crash course. Um, I can't very well include, uh, there were presentations by students, and they did go to the uh, uh, last week, one, one of my classes had no presentations, and nobody signed up for topics one and two. The other class had both topics one and two covered. I think uh, this week at this moment, unless somebody changes, like in group A tomorrow, somebody decides to make a presentation tomorrow, um, there uh, will be, I think, at least one of the tutorials tomorrow will not have coverage of chapters one and two of the textbook, uh, of the main, of the big textbook. Um, so it's kind of going to be kind of hard for me to include questions about chapters one and two. Uh, the first two, not one and two, but the first two, um, well actually the second one was this when I presented today, in less seconds. So yeah, the, the second one presented this week uh, by a couple of people is chapter three of the crash course. So I covered that much in more depth than they did. So chapter three definitely will be, but chapter, the, the, the chapter from the textbook is not being presented to everybody. Um, I am I am talking a little bit about it in the classes where there's not a student presentation. So I'm not, I guess I won't say there will be absolutely nothing, but it will be nothing. I can't very well include anything that I didn't talk about myself. I didn't make sure it was covered. So there might be something from the uh, first topic uh, uh, from the textbook that's, that's in our list, but it would be something I would cover myself in class for those. They didn't have a student presenting.